Stevens sitting next to each other? Is that what we got going on? I hate when that happens. So far, I mentioned have you done so the Hollywood events? Tom separated us. I did one a year ago, Tom. Tom, Tom uh, am I the only one who's not, like, previously? <laughs> no, no, no. Brandon and I Pleasure were together at Tom and I were together. We and all three Jason, together. Actually. Oh, nice. Jason. Quite by accident, yes, I think. I know. I don't think there was any. No. There was no collusion. Yeah. There, were, there were no WikiLeaks. But president of the <laughs> Documenting a quid pro quo. All right, we're going to get started in a second here. Cool. Move along. Move along, Shilowitz. Move along, guy. Well, thanks for being here. Um, my name's Tom Flanagan, and I work for a company called Nut Plus Bolt, and uh, we spend a lot of time consulting global brands on their content strategies. And uh, I've been doing this panel for a long time, and I can never remember the name of it because it's so long. So it's, it's really the catch-all panel. So the future of brand partnerships, message technology, media, entertainment, and advertising, so we could talk about anything we want. Um, <laughs> Forgot about content. Well. If, but the most important part is uh, I would like for uh, each of our panelists to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about your job, and, um, and tell me why you do what you do. Put you on the spot with that one. Why you, why you do what why you do. Why I do what I do. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Sherman. I'm the VP of Programmatic Technology at Digitas LBI, uh, based in New York City. Um, it's actually an interesting role as we look to figure out the future. And uh, my role is really to bridge the gap between media teams and the technology groups as more and more media uh, moves into this automated fashion. Why I do what I do, um, because I'm I, previously to this, I was in insurance sales, and that was so brutal and so horrible that uh, I fell backwards into digital media and have just embraced it ever since. That's great. That's a good reason. So having been tired of talking to customers, you now talk to algorithms, and it's so much nicer to go <laughs> so much every nicer. day. Yeah. Okay. Um, I listen for a living, uh, and uh, so I run innovation at Time Inc. We're a 92-year-old company, which when the new management arrived, sorry, I know you want to make that closer. When the new management arrived, um, uh, we were exclusively a print magazine company. One of our brands, you know, I mean, you know, some of our brands like Fortune and uh, Sports Illustrated and People and Time and so forth. There wasn't even a Fortune.com, so we arrived at a point at which we were pretty strictly a print media company. Um, my job as a listener, I think, was mainly to pull together ideas from within and hunt and gather them from outside the company to help us transform from a print company, a 95% print company, to a company that is now, for example, reissuing for the first time in uh, more than a decade Life Magazine, one of our early brands, and it's exclusively a VR publication. Uh, in every form of media now, we now have a larger audience between social and our web presence than BuzzFeed. We have a larger social footprint than BuzzFeed. We've actually come very far, very fast, and I would say what makes it fun is listening on panels like this to people like Jason and Tom and everybody who tell us where it's going. And did you sell insurance as well? One more time. Did you sell insurance as well prior to? Um, no, at, at, at my age, it's even hard to buy it. <laughs> uh, my name is Brandon Rochon. I am Managing Chief Creative Officer of Castor and Partners Los Angeles. We, uh, we're a little small independent agency that happened to be blessed with coming up and being partners with a brand called Red Bull. And what we're trying to do is figure out how to unlock this thing of entertainment and brands and where the future of this whole game is going. At least try to be at the front of it. <laughs> Why did I do what I do? Because my mom told me I had to get a damn job. <laughs> that was basically it. <laughs> I thought, well, I, 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 someone gonna pay me to do it? All right, I can do it. Finally, this. an honest <laughs> answer. That's great, that's great. Um, hi, I'm Jason Dracinovic. I head up um, Innovation for Havas, which is a French-owned multinational agency. Um, Prior to this new role, I, um, I was president of the New York office, and I've worked uh, client side, brand side, um, and have a diverse amount of experience. Um, 
what I do for a living, or why I do it, is kind of the same thing. It's because you know when you come up with a crazy idea and you you want you actually think, can I make it happen? Um, that's what I do, try to make it happen, right? And sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But it's the chase of the dream, chasing that. Can we actually make it happen? Is is what it is. I'm Adam Duretta. I uh, lead our video and entertainment partnerships at Yahoo. Uh, so I get to work on some of our biggest stuff, like our recent partnership with Hulu. I lead our relationship with uh, the big television networks and media companies like CBS and NBC Universal. Uh, why I do what I do? I think it's because while I really do love content, I'm just a nerd in the planet. Like I started out as a software engineer and then I shifted roles into being a really geeky management consultant and somehow at a place like Yahoo there's enough like confusion and need to both understand tech as well as figure out complex organizations as well as understand content that somehow I found a place where that skill set's actually useful. But did you so, sell insurance? Uh, I did not sell insurance. <laughs> I would have. <laughs> Couldn't resist. I'm sorry. It's a good racket. Jen? Uh, yeah, I'm Jen Dennis. I'm uh, the uh, executive producer of uh, branded content and VR at uh, RSA Films. Um, I come from a traditional advertising background. I spent uh, 20 years as a freelancer uh, doing campaigns for everything from, you know, Toyota to Acura to mostly Nike and other Coca Cola products like that. Um, uh, why do I do this is I'm a little bit of, he stole my line I'm a super nerd also <laughs> yes. but um, I'm just passionate about the prospects of changing the game and um, I'm passionate about telling stories and I'm passionate about reaching people and uh, I feel like uh, we're at the golden age of uh, change in our world so I'm just super glad to be here thank you and I never ever sold insurance thank you. <laughs> I actually did tell you the truth. I'm not kidding. So, uh, um, but I, I thought we'd start with. There's obviously a lot of uh, M&A activity, a lot of a lot of big investment coming to the VR space and others. Uh, a lot of Chinese money, of course, coming to the market right now. Wanda acquired um, Legendary Entertainment, three and a half billion dollars. Comcast acquires DreamWorks Animation, four billion. Verizon acquires Complex. Um, the strategy seems to be focused on building these ecosystems where you have content and with distribution built into it. Um, uh, so, question for the panelists. Um, you know, Adam, you're at Yahoo. You see a lot of this activity, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, will companies like Amazon just start buying production companies to make the content themselves um, and cut out the middleman, as it were? And uh, so I want to ask your thoughts on seeing the actual acquisitions uh, so everything can be in-house as, as well as how has M&A impacted you know, any of the companies that you're at? And why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think you are increasingly going to see that. I think the reason that there's you know, so much acquisitiveness in the space is that, I mean, if you look at over the last couple of years where a lot of the, the growth just for kind of media and tech has come from, it's from the players who really own actual ecosystems. So, you know, Facebook and Google have added $250 billion in market cap um, over the last couple of years from really owning kind of their own ecosystem. So I think, you know, you see a lot of the acquisitions that are taking place are really with people who have the large balance sheets um, as well as kind of the, you know, owning some of the billing relationships and or some of that last mile of data, i.e. guys like Verizon and Comcast, um, who actually have the ability to put together the pieces to be able to kind of compete with a lot of the, you know, the two big players who have frankly had a lot of the, the market growth. So I mean, I think it makes total sense why you would see um, guys like Comcast picking up Freewheel, NBC Universal, you know, Verizon with AOL and Adapt TV, and you know, knock on wood, Yahoo. Uh, so I mean, you know, I think. And when you look at Yahoo, as an example, like you, you know, in a world where you're combined with Verizon, all of a sudden now, you have a kind of a powerhouse of brands, a powerhouse of the leader in finance, in sports, in fantasy. You have top brands like Huffington Post, TechCrunch, all under kind of one roof. And then all at the same time, you have the right pieces of ad tech between Bright Roll and Adapt TV, as well as kind of owning 
the data relationship and the billing relationship with the user. Now, has it all been put together into one pretty package yet, um, a cohesive thing? Probably not. I don't think anyone would argue that. But you know that you know, the raw pieces are actually there. And I think that's probably why you see kind of some of the big players identifying the ability to be able to kind of put together those raw pieces. Hey, Jason, how about at, at, at Havas and in an innovation role, what, what role does M&A play in your life? Well, it's interesting. We, we obviously are, have several startups that we run inside our org, and you know, the benefits of, of the network of connections with our clients to enable that to come to life. But it's a change of culture from a, a traditional like advertising media holding company to experiment. And everybody talks about failure being a good thing until, until you write down the investment, right, is, is the hard part. Um, and so there's still a culture where you hit failures have, your failures are, aren't rewarded as much as they are in a traditional VC realm. But increasingly, you're seeing experimentation with that because we have to. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that our clients are being besieged by the aforementioned content players, our partners who actually have their own creative studios, the clients themselves who have internalized some of the creative function. So the, um, the, the creative industry has to reinvent itself in order to be relevant. Because some, and sometimes you could say that's commodity, unless you have an excellence of what you do. And that's, that's what the, the innovation role comes in. It's like doing the things that are different, working in different ways, working in new partnerships. And, and the, the brands themselves have to also take those risks. And what's exciting, I think, as you know, we started, this is an amazing golden age of change, I think was the term that was mentioned. And I would say, well, I hope it's the silver age, really, because you know, the, the epicenter of change really should ex accelerate more and more. And, um, I think brands want to do that more. And they're sort of struggling with uh, how to do that. And so right now, it's about doing those bets and trying the stuff out and measuring it and then comparing it. And what we're seeing is the ones that are working are, are getting amplified pretty, pretty efficiently. Stephen, at Time Inc., um, I read with interest you guys uh, acquired or invested in Jash, my friend's comedy company, which uh, I was happy to hear about. Um, through your time at Time Inc., what, what role has that played um, in your job? Well, without, without being Trumpy about it, <laughs> I'd like to go back to the last question, <laughs> which I really wanted to answer. Which what, But I think it, it relates to what you asked about Jash which is I think we have to define ecosystem as separate from crabbing a little left and crabbing a little right. You add a leg and you crab a little okay. in a different direction. I think the companies you're talking about are doing a lot of crabbing. They all have Apple envy. Apple is an ecosystem. I, don't, I can't think of another actual ecosystem. They all have Apple envy. Apart from th Apple, I would say it's true that companies like Time Inc., and, and we have maybe the greatest portfolio of content brands anywhere, I'd say, it, it, from People Magazine, or if you play golf, we own Golf Magazine, and if it, we own the two largest magazines in the multicultural community, People in Espanol and Essence Magazine, we own Food and Wine and Travel and Leisure and Southern Living. I mean, we are, we're pretty broad. But I would say we don't have any comedy. We didn't have any auto. We have now added auto. We have added comedy. But I don't think we are convinced that that's making us an ecosystem. It's just allowing us to play in some other spaces. And we, too, have Apple Envy. They've figured it out. Will Amazon start buying up production companies? That'll be great news the day they do, because they'll fail for a while. And then they're going to need a lot of help. I mean, it, when you look at what happened when Facebook launched their, when YouTube decided to launch production companies, they started the fund production companies. I, I hope RSA, you didn't get any of it. Maybe you did, so I apologize. The fact is they gave money to all these old line movie guys who used to make hits for other people who had no idea what they were doing with the money for YouTube. So the minute Amazon stops doing what smart programmers do, which is you wait actually for somebody to walk in the door with a great idea and a great package and you say yes and fund it. Um, when the minute they start doing it top down creatively, they're gonna fail. Jen, uh, uh, you know, in, in the community of producers, what, do, what are you guys talking about with all this M&A activity swirling around, and even in the VR space, of course? Well, I mean, that's a hotbed at the moment, obviously, and um, we're, we're in the wild, wild west of virtual reality, so um, I think everybody's sort of playing nicely at the moment. There's not a whole lot of M&A uh, you know, going on 
in that space as much as it will be. Um, but you know, actually in, in our world of production and advertising, that doesn't really touch us as much. It just gives us uh, outlets, you know, it, the, it gives us uh, places to pitch the fact that, you know, Yahoo's making content and, and Amazon, truthfully for us, this is all just, you know, gravy on top of what we do. So, um, you know, the fact that they're willing to make content that's not, uh, you know, uh, sitcoms or, you know, but to really tell stories is, like I said, I'll, I'll use the silver expression, but I, I think it's both silver it's and gold. It's just my comic book nerd coming out. That's, that's I think it. that's what that was. But, you know, that, that doesn't affect us as much because we're, we're, in essence, sellers. So right. that's my answer. Well, let's, let's go to VR. Let's talk about VR. Um, we, uh, billions of dollars are also, of course, pouring into VR right now. Um, and most brands seem it, it, it's way too early for them to... Uh, um, you know, others are, are doing some things, obviously, but for the most part, um, you know, it's it's still a bit of a wait and see uh, event. You know, the announcement with uh, with uh, PlayStation, where they have 40 million out in the marketplace, it was going to spur some sort of adoption, at least starting with gaming, et cetera. Um, but so, you know, Brandon, let's start with you as as a creator, as a creative. Um, how are you or your companies prepping? to becoming more active in VR and, and, and why or what are you seeing? What kind of questions are clients asking you guys that are at agencies about VR? Well, I think clients don't know anything about VR, <laughs> you know, and it's much to do with the traditional mindset and not really knowing the benefits of VR and how to monetize that VR. But I think what we have to start doing is as storytellers in the brand space, and connecting uh, to consumers in a very relevant and real way. What VR does is it helps us be able to literally transport a person into a world that a brand could not only showcase what they're about, meaning, you know, when we talk about VR different than advertising, because we can't do advertising in VR, because really, as soon as a Red Bull can or a Coca-Cola can pops up, you're like, fuck you. <laughs> it's just not happening. But if you start to look at VR from more of what I say, we start talking about it from a heart of a brand, a soul of a brand, and the value of a brand, now we can really start using VR to tell stories that truly are impacted by brands and what they believe and what they do. Uh, can I jump in here a little bit? Um, you know, and this is not a, a client that I worked on, but I want to talk about a great example of a, a brand that you wouldn't expect to be in VR, and that's Arby's. And um, you know, Arby's has really embraced this uh, major league gaming thing, and I'm not affiliated with this work where my agency's not involved with it. But what was interesting about it is it wasn't necessarily um, the Coke can and, and saying F off. It was more about, you know, there's a pastrami sandwich in the shooter game, and you get power mm -hmm. up by shooting the sandwich. Mm -hmm. So it, like, is, it speaks to the vernacular of that medium. For sure. And, the, and like, they had, like, un unrequited love for this. Like, people mm -hmm. would chant Arby's <laughs> and, like, from the audience and then actually go to the outlets and set up LAN like Counter-Strike things mm. in the store, right? And, um, and so that's where you're seeing it. If you can make fun of yourself a little bit. For sure. And not take yourself too seriously sure. and like put, your, put the brand out there in a way that is... Uh, well, that's why I mean it has know, to go it, to an entertainment yeah. space. Yeah, exactly. It becomes a valuable space. experience, right? Exactly. So Brian, so. Brian, how about in your, in your world? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, um, you know, I think we all recognize that mobile is the number one destination where consumers are spending their time. And I think we also recognize that advertising on mobile is both annoying and the ad, the traditional ad unit doesn't work. Um, and it's obvious you know, we want to get rid of the interstitial and the band and all that. And I totally get that. Um, but brands still need to be able to reach consumers where they are. And so I see VR as really a fantastic way to respect the device where your consumer is and bring them that content that, uh, you know, in an entertaining way or in an informative way. Um, and I don't think the consumers are automatically turned off when they see a brand logo so long as they're getting some kind of benefit. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, the proliferation of investment in VR and the number of brands who are starting to say, oh, well, you know, it's, we always want to talk about engagement and time spent with a brand. Well, no better way to do that than through an immersive experience rather than a 320 by 50 at the bottom of, a, of, a, a, you know, of an iPhone. Um, so I think there's a, a huge amount of runway um, and frankly excited for clients to start. I think the number one thing is they build, they, they spend the money on the creative to build the VR. And then the next question is, well, how do I amortize this cost by distributing it? 
Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, where someone like myself and people in our world can say, great, let's, uh, let's push this out to your consumers. Let's leverage everything we normally would do with targeting and measurement, but do it with an ad unit that people actually want to spend time with. But it's not a medium. It's 200,000 people. It's not a medium. I mean, in, uh, it, it, when, it, when you feed, there is a lot of supply. People talk about, oh, well, you know, we got to create more VR content. No, you have to create one VR hit because we are a hit-driven business. This is an entertainment panel. One hit will help lead everybody to where it needs to go. So, yes, we haven't created that hit yet. But in relation to that, you have a tremendous amount of supply, a lot of it from people selling uh, glasses, a lot of it from advertisers who in 2015 when there was all this shuffling and shifting of agencies of record committed to some kind of a VR program that they're now playing out. But the truth is you're playing to, I mean, think of, a, th- think of how we funded medium for decades, uh, media for decades, uh, a, a CPM, right? 200 bucks, pretty good CPM. I can't think of any industry that wouldn't be happy with a $200 CPM. Great, I have 100,000 people watching. If I've spent $21,000 making it, I've, spent, I've lost money on this thing. So I think we're at a place at which it is part of the future if we don't turn people off with bad experiences so that they're hesitant to pick up the glasses when the good stuff comes along. And uh, uh, yeah, it's artificial right now. The supply, more study has to be done of the demand side. What do people want? What are they really willing to spend the money on rather than this sort of, uh, I think, rather anarchic distribution? Imagine if IMAX had been distributed the way VR is distributed. How would Francis Thompson and Brad Wexler and those guys who brought us IMAX, the brilliance of what they did um, was they curated what got put on the screen and insofar as they could, dealing with input from creators and the best of what walked in the door, they made sure that each experience was better than the next. There's nothing like that kind of curation growing a VR audience right now. Um, I'll be happier when it is because then it can become the medium (laughs) that these guys can figure out how to distribute and monetize. And Jen, I know you can make a hit. Come on. (laughs) You've done it before. You've done it before. you know, I, I kind of agree, but I'm also going to sort of disagree. Like, there are two sort of streams that are fighting against each other at the moment. You're right, there's a lack of hardware, and uh, what there is that's that's minimally ab- available is not good, but luckily things like Daydream is, is coming out now, which is much more affordable. We'll get a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more play, and people will be much more comfortable watching that, that than holding a cardboard box to their face. And um, I believe that the content is getting better and better. I mean, I've... You know, I'm, I'm a, an expert now after two years, but uh, you know, I get to luckily travel around and see a lot of, of stuff out there. And I'm telling you from two years ago when I started looking at stuff to where I am now, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that gem that people need to see and need, and need to, to see in VR and, and, and to be in that experience. And I think also there's gonna be a wave of sort of champions that get on board now, um, you know, whether that's celebrities or musicians or, that, that need to help us bring this up as well. So it's, it's definitely in its infancy, but as my friend Chuck from Real FX says, we're, we're working in, in dog years here. Every one year is seven years. And we're making leaps and bounds, we're making uh, technical and hardware and content uh, leaps and bounds. So I'm very, very hopeful that it's uh, around the corner, actually. I, I do agree with you on the kind of bringing in you know, different forms like musicians and that kind of thing. I, I can speak from experience just from, on the Yahoo side, we recently had a partnership with Live Nation for a year where we were live streaming one concert per day for 365 mm-hmm. days. Mm-hmm. In a lot of ways, it was you know, an extremely successful partnership, but one thing I think it would be fair to say is, is that um, going to any live event or any concert is a extremely experiential thing that's very, very hard to replicate Mm -hmm. in any kind of either desktop environment or mobile environment. It's hard to give users a reason to keep coming back to something like that versus just going to the event. Mm -hmm. For the first time ever, I'm like thinking, God, I wish we had entered into that Live Nation partnership today or next year 
They're in an environment where all of a sudden, now like you have a model where you could see, even with, to your point, of only a couple hundred thousand people actually have, you know, being out there that are able to do it, you know, price points can get to a point where you can actually have a pretty profitable business with live events. So yeah. whether it's Live Nation and Hulu, I know that they just entered into a partnership. I think there is some potential. I think like live events might be our first kind of entryway into that. We definitely need gateway stuff for sure. And that's, yeah. that's one of them. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you've seen the experience with the, it's one of the very first ones done, but, uh, you know, Paul McCartney on the stage. And it's, if you've never stood on the stage while the concert's going on, it's pretty unbelievable. It's pretty impactful. Yeah. But so. you guys were very early. Way back when you made the Live Nation deal, the thought was, if I can put you in a front row seat in a concert a thousand yep. miles away, yep. that that front row seat was scalped for 2800 bucks that, that you don't yep. have, um, that'd be pretty exciting. I think the front row seat thing hasn't worked, and to your point, where you are right now, I mean, what Fox Sports is doing now, for example, and watch their trajectory, and we're all learning from each other, They've just created now a suite at the basketball yep. game, and I can invite five friends in the suite, and I can populate it with yep. a party all around me, and I can have all the stats available in front of me that are available to the people calling the game. Now, if you add the social dimension, yep. and maybe eventually a haptic dimension, you now have an actual uh, VR. I think uh, right now we're in that world where it's probably to everybody's benefit to conflate VR and 360 a little bit because true VR, which will include, as Mark Zuckerberg mentioned the other day, they're going to try to add the social dimension to it. Mm -hmm. Once you've included a true social dimension and possibly a haptic and, and enhanced display dimension, um, then you'll have something called VR and at that moment and credit should be due to Ridley Scott and your company, because today, I think if you polled the people in this room, all of whom are here because they have some interest in VR among, uh, among other things, but there's a lot of VR in this conference, today the high water mark is The Martian. It's the best most of us have, have seen. It's your work. It's great, wow. and it's the best most of us have seen. My buddy, Mr. Shilowitz, over there. Well, and and um, a lot of people... Uh, my buddies. And, and, and I'm... I mean, it's no surprise that a lot of people have never even put on a VR headset, and they're talking about VR. So I think that notion is presence is, is the term that is the mm -hmm. co-presence is what's going to drive a, a mass adoption. And we've already seen those experiments. Um, you know, if you imagine the behavior now when you Skype when you're away from your family, or, or you even, um, I've done this myself, so I travel a lot, watched a game with my kids back mm -hmm. home. So this, this is a behavior that's happening now. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's going to be the, I think the uh, accelerant to how brands and um, narrative can happen. Yeah, there's so many branches and verticals involved with this, like the social ability. Like that's not even being, it's just being scratched right now. But again, dog years. We'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> well, it's a good segue. I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase Bill Gates because he's probably not here, so I could just make up what something he's, I think he said. Um, he said, we tend to overestimate change that will happen in two years' time and underestimate what will happen in 10. So I, I think that's kind of appropriate to the VR conversation, but, but I want to tie it to something else. So here we are, 2016. Um, what makes advertising more effective now with all the advances in technology um, and all the different consumer platforms that have evolved in the last 10 years than it was 10 years ago? Um, so uh, why don't we start with, uh, with, with Brandon? Why are, we, why are we in a better place? Yeah, that's you. Um, <laughs> You do work for you. You're an advertising guy, I'm right? Guy, yes. Okay. <laughs> this is you're in the business. Now, I know. Right? I That's know. Right. I know, man. Should have took that damn. Job. Or are we not in a better place? Ten years. Uh, I think. You know, I think advertising is. I. I don't know if we are in a better place. You know, and that's just my opinion. And I think we as marketers and advertising and creatives in this world start to think of our lack of thinking of advertising from a true or of a selling way. And something that I constantly tell my teams and tell my agency is we have to partner. Like advertising has become so insular and like, I know, I know, I know, I got it, I got it. When we gotta start opening up those conversations and starting talking to these people, like Hollywood talks to you and it's not about, hey, I have the best idea, it's I have a great idea, how can we make it better? And so advertising now has gotten, it's like you see it keeps coming back and forth. We have companies like Coca-Cola who used to go from big storytelling to these huge spots and you know, wanting to then go into social media and starting, you know, user-generated conversation to now go straight back, focus on the product, focus on the product, focus on the product, focus on the product. 
So then as an advertiser, and we look at the world with VR, we look at social, how does advertising start to play into that as a natural part of a conversation? Because we can no longer interrupt it, because that's not disruptive. And then we try to disrupt it, and then all we do is interrupt it again. So I think that's why advertising, we need to step back as an industry. I don't think it's going, I don't think it's dying, but we need to step back and say, we have to challenge this model. It's the only model that has not freaking changed. And we don't want it to change. I think digital has played a big role in that, though. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there have been great leaps and bounds in terms of, you know, giving like Chipotle's, like, you know, forms to table Absolutely. stories. And, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, we worked on some Nike stuff, which was a webisodic show yep. for eight episodes. And it had massive traction. A lot of people very targeted. And I feel like people don't give that as much credit as, as they should. And advertisers mm -hmm. are still afraid to put money into that world. Absolutely. Um, and they, they still go to that, you know, you know, airtime model, yep. which... Well, I think you gotta do, like, Red Bull is a great example of a brand that is a media, you know? And it's probably one of the only brands that literally behaves like a media and says that we don't have consumers, we have fans. And we think about the fan first, way before we ever think about the can. Now that starts to change, it's a whole different mindset when you have a brand that thinks that way. Now me as an advertiser is like, oh shit, like, okay, we're not making a commercial here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else can it be? So I think when, when advertisers start to think that way, and we as just an industry and brands as well start to get on that, like you said, like Jen and I, we've worked on tons of projects together and great projects, you know, and award-winning projects, but how many times we walked into a huge client, say like a Samsung, and pitched something that was like, yo, this could really change the model of how people interact with your brand and your advertising, and they look at us and they go, yeah, that's cool, so tell me about this 30 second spot that you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about the what? The sponsorship? The, 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 the helicopter awesome. shoot, right? Oh, the yeah. Yeah. Spot. So <laughs> I think it's both. I mean, there's still going to be the need for traditional advertising interruption-based yep. spots to drive content consumption. But let's face it, the only time we really put up with that is if it's a must-see TV, live sports, yep. you know, something, yep. something that's award compelling. Shows. Award shows. And that, that's a, those are few and far between. Um, so you got to think about what are you doing the rest of the time? And, you know, someone told me once the best way to predict the future is to like look at what a 12-year-old girl's doing right now in terms of how they consume media. Amen. And I, that's where it is. It's, it's, you know, they're doing their homework together online. They're sharing everything in, in individual social networks. So it's not necessarily them, you know, building a new portal. It's bringing the content to them where they are. And so we like to phrase that as marketing to a market of one. Like it's, it's one customer as a person, as an individual. And, and it's getting the content to them in the right narrative in the right way. Um, and that's not, I mean, some brands aren't gonna exist for that, for that market and they just won't evolve. Um, and they may actually see that spot on, this, on the, the show that they watch and, and that might be the only time they have an interaction for it. But the times where there's branded value platforms and you're seeing this across all of these case studies is when it becomes an essential part of their life. And that's, that's where advertisers and brands have the ability to evolve. Brian, uh, Brian you know, I hear a lot you know, clients, brands get get blamed for not taking risks, and uh, and the cultures at the at the at the company prevents um, change or innovation. But uh, you know, having worked for ad agencies most of my adult life, uh, uh, the same is true on the ad side. So so the culture at agencies is uh, that um, they're protecting their positions, what they know how to do. Um, so. Um, how do you guys deal with that at a place like Digitas, culturally, internally, at your agency, as well as with your clients? Yeah, sure. So just to pick up kind of on the last point and get to there, I think one of the big challenges is the, con you know, the consumer is always going to be ahead of the brands, right? Mm -hmm. But the speed at which the consumer is, uh, cons consumer is going 60 miles an hour, brands going 45, mm -hmm. so they just keep pulling away. And so I think a lot of times when we talk about innovation, it's um, it's like innovation in the moment to get to where we are, where they are now, but it's hard to predict where they're going. So I like the concept of like, well, what is the middle school group doing? And But how long is that even relevant before they move on to something else? Um, and, I, and so I ultimately, uh, the point around how do we how do we try and promote innovation and promote uh, new ideas in, in the way that we create ads, I mean, Digitas full service, so we do everything from the creation of content to the distribution of content by media. Um, I think it is very much so the balancing act of our brands wanting to uh, still work off of traditional reach metrics and drive, uh, you know, drive things as simple as page visits, which we can all sit here and say, 
oh, we shouldn't do that. We should move beyond that. We should move beyond that. But um, you know, there's in, there's infrastructure challenges with trying to uh, the way that they see dry, you know, uh, attribute revenue. And if there's something that's worked, whether it be the television schedule or uh, reach-based media uh, online, you know. It's one, you have to appease that, you have to satisfy that uh, to maintain the client and keep them happy. But then you also have to be willing to, to the point around failing, it's not always just a failure of an investment that doesn't go well, but you have to be willing to be accountable, put your name on something, and when it goes wrong, be able to say, yeah, that didn't work, but this is why we did it. Let's remember back six months to when we said yes to this, what did we want to get out of it? And the bottom line is always important, but uh, I think a big part of what we try and do is tell our clients, you know, it's not about let's do 5% testing budget or 10% testing budget, but what is it that we want to, wh where do you want to go next year? Like, it's going to take time from the concepting and the development of the idea and the contractual agreements and finding the right partners, but let's put that time in and then let's evaluate at the end of the year and say, did we move the needle on where we want to go as marketers as opposed to just hitting those bottom line metrics. And it's a, um, I think some brands do it quite a bit better than others, uh, but it's in many ways dependent on the structure with which they're measured and how they're incentivized on their end. I mean, the good news is that Brandon has allowed everybody to survive what is a fairly challenging year, maybe even more than a year. Not Dunkirk exactly, but it's a point at which, uh, to Brandon's point that you have to listen to the consumer, the consumer went from, as a publisher, I see, I have a direct relationship to the consumer, direct relationship to the advertiser. In many ways, I have a more direct relationship to the consumer than the advertiser has in some respects. Uh, advertisers are starting to collect the data and catch up to us, but we still have the direct relationship. We went from 15% of our consumers, what, under three years ago, coming to us on mobile devices. We were like, just as we were launching into becoming an omnimedia company, we were getting really good at desktop. Then, and we had, we do, were doing it in a year, which was 2013-14, when only 15% of our customers were coming to us this way. Then there was that year that wasn't enough to change the world, but certainly had us rethinking things when 35% of our customers came this way. Now it's 75 to 80%. And I would say that the challenge that we are hoping as publishers, everyone in advertising on this table can solve is how do I make that mobile ad something that I look forward to? Because it, it would be well, I don't think an, it's an unfortunate, ad. it would be an the answer. What? It's not an ad is the answer. It's, right, it's, an, it, it's, it, something it's that a you form of engagement about, right? which yeah. involves hopefully Either my content. a story content. or something <laughs> emotional and, and maybe that's tied to your content, but it's got to do something that makes me want to care. Yeah, exactly. right? yeah, but the challenge there is then, okay, so the ad's great and it's not an ad, it's an experience and the consumer falls in love, but then they want to take an action, they want to engage with your brand, and you send them to a page that they don't really know what to do. It doesn't mirror the experience they just had. It's maybe the ad is a beautiful, immersive story, and then the website is like the same garbage it's always been. Um, the call to action can't doesn't carry through. So I mean, I think we it's very oftentimes think about like the front end, what the consumer sees is great, but you know, consumers want that experience to be carried through to the end goal. It's you know they want to buy products, they want to support the brands and and you know wear the clothes that make them feel this and that, but. If the experience they get when they land on the site, especially on mobile, is not uh, doesn't you know give them that opportunity, then you've lost them. You've lost spent all your money on the front end. So um, somebody uh, once said, "Strategy is really about finding a reason to say no." Um, and uh, so that the, all of us, in one way, shape, or another, have to are, are content strategists. So, but nobody really has defined, everybody tends to have a, a, a very different definition about content strategy. So, Jen, when you're working w with clients, um, how, do you, how, how do you define content strategy? How does that work at RSA from a, from a strategist st strategy standpoint? Again, that's an interesting question because nine times out of ten, you know, I do come from a, the advertising side, so I get the strategy, but, you know, I find that production companies like an RSA, you know, unless they're working in something groundbreaking like a VR platform, that we're, we're executional. 
So, and it's kind of actually kind of one of the most frustrating parts about being on this side, not being on the advertising side where I come from, is I'm not privy to the strategical uh, element of it. So I kind of don't have an answer for that from my purview. Well, let me ask you this, this is a different question. So someone that runs a very successful production company said to me the other day, after all these years of, uh, of working with clients who brought them, here's the brief, here's the strategy, go make this. Mm -hmm. Often what, what happens is the client comes on set, whispers in the ear, hey, there's something I want to talk to you about. And so now basically he's like, well, the cat's out of the bag now. It's, it, we're just going to compete against what used to be our bread and butter at this point. Um, yeah. So wh wh where, do, where do you cross that line? Well, in a, in I think like three years ago, nobody would dare to have crossed that line probably. And I think those lines are certainly blurred at this point in advertising and, you know, uh, brands go direct to production companies fairly regularly now for sure. But uh, they don't um, necessarily engage production companies, I don't think, in strategic elements because we're not, we're not really built to be full, full uh, not that we shouldn't be, that's actually something I've been trying to sort of push at RSA, um, but they, the production model to to my eyes, there, there are ones that are doing well, anonymous content, uh, um, uh, Smuggler, a few other, you know, with, with Here Be Dragons and whatnot, but that, that is an area that I, I think that, you know, at least, you know, is an open field now that we can try to, to be more involved with the strategy in, in, in pro projects, but it, it, it's few and far between. Well, well strategy's boring, so let's forget that question. Uh, so, but let's stick on. Fabulous. Let's stick. On, let's stick with production. Um, uh, at Yahoo, for example, um, w w when clients want uh, content created, yep. what what are some of the solutions that you guys have evolved over the years to meet the demand? Yeah. No, I think so. On our side, we uh, we've evolved quite a bit over the last few years in terms of how we think about content production at Yahoo. I think if you had talked to us a few years ago, um, the way that Yahoo was oriented from a kind of selling structure was much more around kind of direct agency and direct brand relationships that were kind of seeking to do much bigger ticket things and bigger ticket productions. So think about things like, you know, season six of Community or, you know, some of the big ticket originals that we did, like Sin City Saints or, or whatever it is. And I, I think for us, we're getting, we've gotten a lot smarter about um, utilizing our own data um, to understand what content really is going to perform and how we can actually very predictably um, work with clients to know, hey, if you do this thing with us in fantasy football and we do it on a Sunday show in, for fantasy, that we're going to have no problem predicting you know, 50 million impressions or, or however it is. I think for us, the role of a content strategist at Yahoo has now become, there's been multiple roles that have sort of merged together. So I mean, for example, like on some of our social platforms that we distribute our content onto, um, you know, we do have production facilities in New York, LA, and Sunnyvale, but the most successful stuff for us on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and that sort of thing has been stuff that didn't even utilize those production facilities at all. Like, because they were too slow, because it would have taken them 24 hours. To and for us, we needed to catch that, that news story real time and put together something that was a combination of video clips plus text plus images and get it out there in real time in like an hour. Mm -hmm. And for us, like that, if you look at, you know, we've had hundreds of millions of views kind of off network for this type of stuff. And if you look at the top 10 of all of them, it's all that stuff. And in a little bit of way, it's a little bit, you know, a little bit disheartening I mean, as a content <laughs> strategist, but that's for us at Yahoo, a lot of the content strategy roles have become like this merger of like data analyst plus social guy plus do-it-yourself production person. Like yeah. Mashable. I mean, like putting yeah. together that stream is those are some of the most powerful things you find on Facebook or you know, yeah, like yeah. the feed is like, what are the ten best you know episodes of Seinfeld and like? To, oh yeah. I mean, we're all about ten I'm best. Like, I think you hit a really good point there with the epicenter of the insights that we gain from customer data driving a content recommendation. 
Um, and you know that when it's each client you talk to, they're going to have a different point of view on what they're trying to achieve and what their goals are. Um, and what is clearly becoming evident is the pace at which you can deliver the content. You have to be very fast. You have to be flexible, and it has to be short. And what we've seen is success when you empower people that are closest to your customer to help tell the story. Mm -hmm. And so for some of our brands, we've got hundreds of influencers that are actually shooting little stuff on their iPhones mm -hmm. and doing programmatic content creation in their own voice. That's a brand comms. Um, and then you roll that out at scale, dynamically change the creative, the offer, the location where the media is served. It's no longer then an ad, it's, this, it's just a really personal thing that you know, my homie's talking about. Um, and that's where I think the data can give you the insights um, so you're not broadcasting those messages to the wrong people. So it's really precise. It's much more narrow of a segment. Um, and it's also relevant. And so it's kind of, it, it works for me as a user. Right? Brandon, at a, at a brand like Red Bull, I think it's fair to say they, they understand their consumer very well. Uh, explain to us what Red Bull Media House is and, 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 and what, their, what their role is and what that balance is between what you might do and mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah, so I mean, Red Bull Media House is basically the conversation that Red Bull saw itself as a fan-based product. And what they did is they came off and they spin off and they said, hey, there's enough stories around our brand and the people who embody our brand and talk about our brand and live our brand and breathe our brand that we should figure out ways to elevate them, quote unquote, give them wings. Start Instead of focusing on us trying to sell the can, how can we sell the true just value of you know Red Bull vitalizes body and mind, and hence gives you wings. So therefore, it spun off with started out Media House started out as you know uh, sport um, like athlete sponsorships, sponsorships, right? And so now there's hundreds, hundreds of Red Bull athletes who are not only sponsored by the brand, but the brand helps to then give them wings and figure out how can they become better at their thing. And then it was saying, well, how can we do that in the music industry? And how can we do it in the film industry? How can we do it? And all of a sudden, this brand went from, hey, instead of let me sell this can of liquid to you, let me sell the vision of why we believe this can of liquid exists in the first place. Now, Media House, now it comes around, you have the can business at Red Bull and you have the Media House business at Red Bull. And those are two separate, very separate businesses, but yet they help each other. Right, so like we said, not every brand can sit there and become a media house. It's just not gonna happen. But what Red Bull has done very, very well is being able to stay true to the visionary of Mr. Dietrich Mateschitz, who invented Red Bull, of what he, why he started it in the first place, was to truly elevate and to champion the relentless pursuit of the human endeavor. And that's all the brand stands for. And the brand was like, we're not gonna get marred down in trying to sell more cans. We're gonna get marred down in trying to sell this vision. So that is where I think Media House and Red Bull, it's, it's for a brand to do that, like we were saying, it's, it's hard because we gotta get matrices and we gotta sell product and how do we start to separate those two things? Now, with a brand like Red Bull doing it, more brands are starting to take note to that and saying that it is about how to be real time, how to do something that is absolutely talking now. So Red Bull, we always talk about, not Red Bull at Kastner, we always talk about how that, Agent, the industry and the agency model is like the, the old record label model. Everybody wanted to drop albums. And I was like, bump that, we're not drop albums, we're gonna drop hits. And all we do is drop hits, one hit after another. I think now we're dropping just beats. Now we're dropping beats, <laughs> right? Exactly. right? It's, it's getting even we're shorter. It's getting even notes, shorter. So I'm now sure we have to be nimble and fast and super quick. And so now when Red Bull has a production company, its own production company, I don't need to go to an RSA. Right. What? Now I love to go to what? RSA. I love to go to RSA because I love gin and I love RSA. But Red Bull, there's it happens so fast that Red Bull is capturing all of their content. Like for me to go out and shoot something for Red Bull, they're going to be like, you know what? Well, we a lot of Palooza, but we got we literally got a hundred people tweeting and videotaping and capturing and streaming. So you don't need to produce anything for us. Just hey, let's make sure we're staying on strategy. Let's make sure we're staying on message. Let's make sure the brand. <laughs> is staying true to what the brand stands for. But as far as us going out and saying, hey, I have a TV spot or I have a content piece I want to shoot for you, they're like, great, you can come up with an idea. Red Bull probably have already come up with it, and they'll say, well, cool, we'll give you a, a, how many producers, we'll give you directors, we got writers, all of that in-house. So now I look at my traditional background of going to production companies and partnering with them, and my biggest brand says, we got this. And you're like, damn. <laughs> So, Stephen, wh wh where was the tipping point as a publisher where you start raising your hand and say, oh, 
not, we don't want to just do the media buy with you, but we could actually create the content that would be helpful to you. What we're talking all around goes back to this and the solution we've arrived at, not one we necessarily would have chosen, all of us, on both sides, publishing as well as advertising, because we are sort of locked together to some degree, is native. And what this conversation illustrated, it sort of got ahead of itself in a way, is reminding everybody of the greatest challenge of native, which is that I used to be Time Magazine by delivering the news once a week. Now it's, you know, by the, by the time I've read the thing about the latest Trump, yeah. Bill, whether Bill Clinton's a cocaine addict, you all have read it in nine other different things since early this morning when it was first being surfaced somewhere on an obscure blog. So being real time, I think, will turn out to be one of the challenges of what I hope we all solve, which is native, which is the integration of storytelling which is engaging with brands who need to find a way into these devices that aren't, to your point, look, don't look just like an ad. So uh, I'd say as a company that puts out 800 fresh posts a day, and with due respect to other content uh, providers, uh, one that famously just sort of rewrites everybody else's stories. I won't mention their name. CEO's a friend of mine. Uh, but that's what they do. They rewrite a lot of other people's content. And then other folks who have built a brand around reading the story and sort of rewriting it with a hipper kind of uh, uh, talk, you know, shuck and chive, I would say. Um, the, um, we have the editors of People looking at what's the latest that's happening in Hollywood and celebrities. We have the editors of Sports Illustrated looking at the latest sports stories. We actually have brands and credible writers who are still able to turn out 800 to 1,000 posts a day. At the moment, I'm, I'm waiting for the phone call from any one of these guys, I'll leave you my number, that says, hey, we want that kind of we want, to br we, we want to attach our brand, we're a little nervous about those guys who sort of make all this stuff up. We want to attach our brand to credible content from credible sources from premium, with premium branding attached. So I'm hoping that native is a big part of our future, but we all have to get the real time thing right. Because the, it's not right on the agency side, where except for Jason, who like Robin Williams, just thinks faster than any human I've ever known. Well, um, I don't know about that, but I'll, 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 I do know that it's not always on, and it's about always relevant. And sometimes that's right. be, being like smart, it means you're not saying anything, right? And not trying to step in. But brands like often step in, it's gonna blow up viral moment, and then that ends up being wrong. So you have to be, Careful, but also smart. But I think that, right? I think like when we talked about Media House once again, like when I said brands are, are the new medium. You know, Red Bull has its own publications. Red Bull has its own TV station. Red Bull has its own production company. Red Bull has its. Own, I mean, literally everything about Red Bull is about Red Bull. You're an ecosystem. We're an ecosystem, and I think brands are going to start to get smart like that. And like you said, they're going to start hiring people from Timing, from Yahoo, all that to bring inside of their companies, and they're just going to become their own ecosystem. Ecosystem based off of once again the brand value hopes and soul of a brand to start bringing this stuff real time and then I don't have to worry about well, what were they saying what are they saying because I'm bringing fans in now that is what when we start to tap into that and we start to look at that which we can start to see it now with brands starting to hire creative directors from big agencies now to go and become CMOs to start thinking differently is brands are going to start to become more insular and they're going to hire their own little thing they're going to have they're going to be their own Timing. They're going to be Keeping all the cookie and device data exactly. themselves. So, Stephen, you mentioned native advertising, which uh, we all remember. It used to be special advertising section. We'd, re we'd read an article, be halfway through, and realize, oh crap, this is an ad. Um, and now that's transitioned into um, something that's that could be much more valuable than being felt like you're being fooled. Um, so, um, Brian at at, at Digitas. How do you guys talk about native when a client comes to you and says, and uses literally uses the term "we want native advertising"? Yeah, um, <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, 
personally believe that Native gets us out of the world of display, which is great. Out of the world of? Display. Okay. Gets us with the same scale in feed as a lot of publications are going to in mobile. Um, I also think it, it, the biggest challenge that we have when uh, is you lose a little bit of control uh, from the brand side. And so if you're the type of client who traditionally wants to see a screenshot of every asset that you have in market, uh, to ensure the look and feel is right. Uh, that's not really a possibility. Like I've worked on campaigns where the coming together of multiple, uh, of the, you know, the components of a native ad have gone wrong on very high, premium high quality publishers. Um, and that's the screenshot they get where something's flipped and what, and, and they go nuts. But, um, you know, I think it's, uh, if you want to be, if you want to embrace how consumers are reading these articles in feed, scrolling, the velocity, I mean, I'm sure you guys have stats on the velocity, velocity. with which people Big scroll issue. through your headlines. Sure. And if you want to be in that space, um, you have to be willing to give up a little bit of control and say, you know, this is not a, it's not perfect but we know that it's from a consumer perspective far better than having a weighty ad sitting at the bottom of the page or an interstitial that ruins the entire experience. Um, so it's a bit of a leap of faith, uh, but I think it especially works well with product-based companies who are, want to move different versions of different products in and kind of do a lot of testing with, um, you know, should I show the red shoe or the green shoe? I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there for advertisers who are willing to give up that control a bit. I read an article um, uh, uh, or about the new creative director who now instead of making one three million dollar campaign has to know how to do 30 projects at 100 grand each. Um, I think most of you in your career have, have lived through that. The, the, we're living that, it again right now. I'm going, going right back. now. Right? <laughs> there was a period of time where we had the three million, but those are kind of few and far between now. It's a lot of it's a lot of new ways of working. Lots of these smaller things, you know. Want to test it out, and you can still get some big brand campaign stuff. But you know, I think the exper experimental stuff on the fringe, you know, it's testing and iterating. It's building little applications and putting them in market and actually measuring it. And um, you know, that's usually in the under half a million range, um, unless you've got somebody who's just really bold. You know. So, so Brandon, what do you see when you're hiring young creatives now, and um, and uh, who haven't lived through what you lived through, where the, the budgets and the nature of the work has changed so much? Well, I think I've, <laughs> it's funny because I hire lots of millennials. <laughs> but um, what I love about it is they're, they're makers and doers. You know, they hate to wait and they hate to fear the process of, okay, now I gotta come up with an idea, then I gotta get somebody to say yes to it, then I gotta go sell it to somebody. Just and then they gotta say it. It's like, let's just go and make it. We could be done by the time you get to the third conversation. We could have four pieces out, you know. So that's what's, what's really cool about that kind of stuff. And they're not marred in the whole, well, do I have to, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of ignorance behind it, but there's a little bliss to that. <laughs> because there are smart people like on this panel who have been doing it for a long time and there are a reason that they are where they are. But I also think that the younger, something that I do when I hire people is I'm asking them following, like what is, their, what is your following? Like how do you connect to people organically? And I'm not saying you gotta be some big Twitter, you know, guru and Insta famous and all that other stuff. <laughs> but you have to understand that Consumers work in real time, and we have to start to get our brands to start transitioning to that thinking. So let's go out and we just make, and then we sell. Instead of going out and asking for permission, let's go ask for forgiveness. I'd rather sell you something that's already made, and you can say yes or no, instead of me trying to convince you into letting us make it. We call that prototype, not PowerPoint. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really the new good. pitch, right? You don't even show them a deck, you just show them Show them, here you go, here's a prototype. It's, it's actually interesting, the, uh, the reference I made earlier to like, a lot of our top 10 performing things being a lot of these quick hit things, our number one video almost ever uh, on a social platform was one that when uh, someone had had an idea to create Titanic 2, which was literally like a true to scale version of the original Titanic, which was a cruise ship. And in real time, we got a video out that basically kind of, you know, brought together, you know, some like, you know, crazy stuff about what that might look like and all that kind of thing. And for months, for, for almost the entire year, it was our top performing thing on Facebook. And it was the 23-year-old who had just graduated from college two weeks ago who created that. 
Uh, and you know, to me, I was just like, good God, like what a, you know, what, what a changing world. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta give them the tools and like a lot of our, our new engagements are putting those experimental centers in with the brand or in with the content company or in with the production company embedded. Um, and sometimes it's cross brand agency, yep. two couple agencies work together on it, sometimes competitive, sometimes with media companies. Um, and that's sort of the, the new normal now is this uh, frenemy is working together, um, trying to crack it. Yeah, there's, just real quick, there's a lot of talk about one do one do on marketing, and then you know you want your video to get you know, 50 million hits. Well, what's wrong with 5,000 people really liking the thing you produced? Yeah. That to me is as one to one as we're going to get to. And for those 5,000 people, if you can scale that out across you know a couple hundred videos, you're probably having more of an impact in, with someone than just having the big one hit wonder. Um, that becomes I almost have to watch it as social currency, whether or not I actually care at all. Yeah, when they're, they're self-selecting into that content, they're going to be a more valuable uh, customer. Um, Jen, how about, how about with, with, with VR? Um, uh, Jason mentioned prototyping. What, what kind of budgets, if you can say, range our clients saying, well, we want to try something. We don't know where to start. What's it going to take? Well, I, I, you know, obviously the, the start and the end of that are two very diametrically opposed. Uh, from the very high end, obviously, it can be a very expensive medium if you want to be interactive and CGI and all that stuff. But from the very baseline, I mean, uh, I think people, if they've watched any of the stuff on uh, the New York Times, there's a piece called The Walking Man. And uh, a friend of mine produced that. And that was done for probably $150,000, huh. which is not a lot of money. But I think one of my favorite ideas, and I think that it'll, it'll, it'll pick up and it will also help sort of move the needle on, on VR is... Uh, a friend of mine who works with a sort of a VR boot camp is creating a boot, they, they just told all their, their young director types to run out and buy a $300 Nokia 360 video camera and start creating. And I think things like that are going to start to push that in the same direction of instant and sociability and shareability and whatnot. So it's, everybody's like afraid of VR because it seems very expensive, but there's going to be uh, gateway, um, cheaper uh, uh, ways to get people involved. I think you'll see that this this Christmas with Daydream. Yes, um, totally. For those who don't know, Google's just dropped this thing, and you know their whole their ecosystem is pretty tight. I would <laughs> say, <laughs> yeah. say, Steve, um, they, they seem to be um, rocking that. Just a good example. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, in some ways, they may have even just leaped on a little bit because their I mean, their phone works <laughs> or has a has a uh, has a cable for your speaker. At least that's. Funny. But um, it, that, that's a $200, I think, $300 price no, point yeah, something, and that's 179. like, it's almost a Christmas present. I was actually thinking that's affordable for people to, you know, that are gamers or like, or just want to do something different, right? Yeah. I mean, that's already bringing it down, making it more democrat, you know, democratized, and that's all we're really trying to do at this point, is get those headsets. And I think eventually, AR, VR is going to be where your phone is anyway, yeah. so, you know, I hate to say it, but it's not going to be this anymore, <laughs> it's going to be this. Yeah, I think you touched on this notion of the brand is the interface, mm -hmm. which is uh, something we talk a lot about. You know, it's not necessarily the mark of the logo anymore. It's like a moving thing. It's a GIF, or it's even how you navigate with it. Um, and great bands, like, you can look at some of this now, using smart data and content to drive it. It's a visceral, living thing. Well, I was going to talk about drones and GoPro and a bunch of stuff, but s speaking of drones, if, you, if anybody hasn't seen it, um, uh, Uber in Mexico, I think this week, where all the bad traffic jams are, they literally sent drones out over the cars, hold, and then the, the drones were holding uh, an ad, basically saying you should be riding an Uber, not <laughs> contributing to the pollution in Mexico City. So look that up. It's really it's I just saw that crazy. Too, yeah. um, uh, I, I think we better open it up uh, for questions now that we we only have a few minutes left. Questions. Right there, please. Yeah. Um, when we all first started out in the television business, um, I'd like to bring it back to like digital and entertainment and how this is you know, merging for people who are on the storytelling side of the business. Uh, when we started out, advertisers used to advertise against stories that didn't have ads in them. They had ads that were not embedded into the story. And you guys are doing a really great job of changing that, in part because of the personal addiction. Nobody wants to watch ads. I'm with you. <laughs> I hate them. I don't take it personally. It's the truth. Well, there's one day you do want to watch it. <laughs> well, 
Well, maybe two. <laughs> two reasons. Maybe, maybe two. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not us versus them. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily, both of those are okay. The, you, know, you can have a really let me, well let me, scripted. Sorry, for one second. Let me repeat, repeat the question, question because it's a live stream. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I, the basis of the question is that balance between uh, the writer and the person who represents the brand, how, how do we maintain it so um, the, the right story is really being told? And I, I, was, I think my initial response is that it is both still, and it's not gonna be one winning or one not winning, it's, it's different based on the narrative you're trying to tell. Um, and I think that's why storytelling is still so important to us, is that it, that's why we as humans experience the aesthetics of our life and, and we seek that and we wanna do that with our peers. Um, if brands can make that happen, then, then maybe that, that's cool, right? But if they can't, well then stay out, right? And I think that that's, that's clear. Um, and you're seeing some great examples, like back, you know, back to the, the Martian experience. You know, that's a great brand experience that's super cool, right? Uh, it, the only criticism would be that you can't scale it everywhere around the world because it's an experience you have to have. Um, so writers are, are right in the middle of that and you've got to find which one of those or maybe both. You could do both. I, I think it's a great question. I would love to talk to you after this <laughs> because it's something that we talk a lot about in my agency. And it's, first of all, I think clients have to become brave. Right. I always say authentic stories, Coca-Cola, crack whores drink Coca-Cola. It's just true. Right. And what you guys do as a storyteller, and what we have to do is we have to start merging together because something that I know very well is how to speak to brands. Right? I know how to get brands to get a little bit more comfortable with things, how to say, okay, you know what? Let me tell you why this is, I can see you don't wanna associate yourself with that, but let me tell you what it's doing and the conversation that is happening in the world and why your brand should do that. That's the salesman side of me coming out. But what we have to start to figure out really well is how do we partner with writers like yourself who are true storytellers and not let the brand fuck it up and get in the way. And more and more, that's the reason I, th I fought a lot of agencies because it's my idea, you know, it's my idea. I want to go over it and say that I did it. But we have to start figuring out how to partner together and let me do what I do really well and do what you do really well. And then we together can sell something to a brand that is going to not only do amazing storytelling for the brand, but also become super authentic. And that's a conversation we have every day with every client is how do we get more authentic? And so you start, you keep bringing those authentic stories. And if you can't find, not every brand is going to do it, right? Not every brand is going to be brave enough to say the stuff that needs to be said, and that's fine. But the brands that do do it usually spike, and they do really great with consumers because of the truth. So what I do is I look for people like yourself as storytellers, and I say, tell me a story. Tell me a story that you really want to tell, and tell me why you want to tell, and tell me the heart and the vision and the, the purpose of it. And then I can tell you, okay, it may not be for every brand, but I guarantee you we can figure out a way for it to be, if it's right for a brand, that can still be authentic. So you got to figure out who you're going to play with. I could tell an example of a brand that we worked on that did that, and that was Hershey's Jolly Ranchers, which you would never think Hershey was actually a, a I would say, experimental company. <laughs> but uh, after years of, of talking to them, we finally said, hey, you know, you got to go with the, you know, Tell us your stories that suck yes. um, campaign. Um, and that really worked because you know, there's that authentic, authenticity of that's actually what you do with the product, but also it enabled people to like really joke about it. Um, and that was real, right? So that drove incredible engagement and moved product, yep. you know, which is you know, one of those things where you can huh? yeah, you just, you just be real. And this is people telling stories about how much they suck, yeah. right? Um, and then, then you know, that's a good new narrative. And the kids themselves are telling that narrative, but the brand also was able to tell sucking stories. Because we love drama. Period. That's why we're in the debate we're in right now, what's going to happen tonight. The reason why it's so great is because drama, we love it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, shiny, happy asshole, the world, not in my world, I don't, I don't know that. I got real problems. And when brands come to me and talk to me as if like those problems don't exist, I'm like, you know nothing about me. So now you can put a positive spin on it. You know, you can make it stories that suck and literally still to be uplifting and inspiring and, you know, to, to cause a greater good or a greater conversation. But come at it real. And that is why we as advertisers, I can say we, I say me as an advertiser, I love talking to people like you. I'm like, tell me, girl, tell me what I'm doing wrong. 
<laughs> tell me why I'm messing up the storytelling because I'm gonna go tell these I'm gonna go tell these brands. This is what you're doing. <laughs> I think part of the question for the writer, though, if I can just pick up on that, sure. is do you take the paycheck? That's the question. Do you take the paycheck? For example, if Casey Neistat is a brilliant creator, I don't think anyone who knows in this room Casey Neistat and who he is would argue that he's a brilliant creator. Casey actually just goes out every day. He's got a couple of people with a handheld camera, and he tells stories. And I, I hear Casey's making about a million bucks a month right now because he has managed to find on YouTube a huge audience for this stuff he just goes out and does. So having myself been on both sides of this, having been involved with Sundance for a couple of decades and involved with studios for the same length of time, uh, they're the guys who take the paycheck and make hits, and then they're the, these people at Sundance who sort of come in underneath with that $150,000 movie that suddenly is an Oscar nominee. And so I think one of the questions you have to ask yourself as a creator, and I don't think the answer is one or the other, I think the answer is probably both in today's environment where the costs of production are democratized down to the fact that you can go, I'm sorry, and make your own movie. I'm so sorry. All right, sir. So, so YouTube versus uh, television uh, engagement, and, and as a YouTube increasingly more powerful platform to reach people. As someone disqualified or disclaimer, I advertised or marketed for YouTube for uh, three years. So I will say, ironically, yeah, I think if you're on the network side or you're you know kind of the big Hollywood side, you you want to look at how do I get into YouTube. But if you're on the YouTube side. These creators, the first thing they want to do is they want to get mm -hmm. the network contract. And frankly, YouTube wants them to do that. That legitimizes YouTube as uh, you know the, the breeding ground for the next generation of content out there. So I mean, maybe it's a grass is greener situation where we all want to believe that, yeah, I think one of the things we might discuss is around, uh, is television dying? Well, no, uh, because people still want to be on television. It's the definition of what that means, I think, that is changing. Um, it just might but, not be a screen on the wall, right? Yeah, might be a screen in your pocket. Yeah, I'd, I'd look back to the Bill Gates comment. Or just right ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, television has been dying on every one of these panels I've had for ten years. <laughs> it's and, dead, I tell you. Yeah, it's dead. Um, so uh, now it's 2019, by the way. I saw today. Uh, that's the latest. We have time for one more question. How about right here? The question's about native advertising as it, as it applies to VR going forward. I could give an example of something that just launched on, on the New York Times VR thing on, on Sunday, and that was, you know, IBM's my client, and we tell a lot of stories about Watson, um, and the narrative that's told there was from the, be the beekeeper um, point of view. Um, so that's a great example of native storytelling in a VR format that then has downstream assets that can be used for traditional advertising as well as digital social tiles, and that's a story that people want to hear, right? You know, this computers are going to save the world, right? So that aligns with, uh, you know, the brand's proposition that you know they're selling Watson. You could have that come to life through the narrative of a really cool experience where you get to run through the fields and and see the world like a bee does. Um, and then downstream, you've got uh, you know the, the digital support mechanism to enable that to come to life. Like those type of things are, are, I think, are kind of getting closer. You know, maybe that's a three to five minute experience. Um, and then you want to learn more, you end up on a more traditional digital experience. Well, in VR, you're creating worlds, so there's got to be advertising in those worlds. So it's kind of a, you know, inside the inside the inside, inside you know, the Russian doll, you know, eventually. I think it depends on each client. Right? It really does. It depends on what world you're creating, obviously. So, real life. If you can, that's great. Often, you know, like all of us could speak from, oh, we got to get it out Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen sometimes, too. 
Agreed. So maybe Jen could create us a world without politicians. And so let's end on that or note. Or lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>